We're thrilled to be hosting Richard McNally tonight. We're also thrilled to have as our moderator, Bell Adler. And like I said, we're thrilled to be involved in this partnership with Jason Sutherland and the Boston Theater Works. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about that organization, and he's going to encourage you all to see Conspiracy of Memory, and I hope you do that. You can buy your tickets as you're signing up for your membership. Jason Sutherland. Thank you. Thanks for being here, and thank you, Tom, for that nice introduction. Boston Theatre Works is a six-year-old company committed to developing and producing new work by local playwrights as well as regional and national playwrights. This year, we have two local playwrights we've developed uh, works with, and uh, Conspiracy of Memory represents the second of those. We, uh, we first found this play three years ago when it was submitted blind, uh, as a blind submission to our new play festival, and the company of artists that I work with, uh, we all read it, and every one of us said, we have to bring this to the stage. And so over the past three years, we've been developing it, working with the playwright to refine the story. But it is the story of a Holocaust survivor now in his 70s uh, who begins to suffer the advanced stages of Alzheimer's. And through the course of the play, he begins to recollect things that he had blocked out from his days in the camps and eventually uh, identifies a pillar of their community as a Nazi war criminal and a, a doctor who had, he had worked under to do experiments on other prisoners in Auschwitz. So it becomes, it's a combination of a family drama as the, uh, as the grandfather is pr helping the grandson prepare for his bar mitzvah and also a mystery in the sense that uh, it's a question of how much of this is real and how much of this is a fabrication of the disease and what can they do about it? Because he's, he's, his mind is, is so unsteady that you really, that they can't trust his, his testimony. So that's where Tom and I met up and said, hey, we've got, a, we've got a, a, something we can riff on here. And uh, that's where, uh, as, as he refined it, he came up with the, tonight's program. So tonight, if you purchase a ticket to Conspiracy of Memory, which runs the, the next two weeks, we actually had our press opening on, on Sunday, and you'll see reviews in the papers this week. But if you purchase your ticket here tonight, we'll sell it to you for a $5 discount, and I'll be out in the, in the lobby after the show selling tickets. Uh, otherwise, if you want to take a postcard from the lobby out there, and you can give us a call and, and order your tickets uh, any time in the next two weeks, as I said. Although a couple of performances have already sold out, so I would advise you to purchase tickets quickly. Uh, other than that, uh, I need to, my, my next task is to introduce our moderator for the evening. Uh, serving as the moderator for tonight's program is Belle Adler, who is an assistant professor in the School of Journalism at Northeastern University. Professor Adler specializes in television news and teaches TV news production, TV news writing, and interpreting the day's news. She joined the School of Journalism after many years of experience in local news, where she was an investigative producer and a tape editor. Most recently, she worked at CNN as a producer in the cable network's medical unit, where she produced medical stories and was the show's producer for a weekly medical show, uh, the weekly medical show Your Health. In addition, she worked at the UN uh, as the UN producer for CNN during the Gulf War and worked in the San Francisco and New York bureaus as an assignment editor, producer, and tape editor. Currently, she produces hour-long documentaries for cable networks, such as A&E, Discovery Channel, and Animal Planet. So without further ado, here to kick things off is Belle Adler. Thank you. Thank you all for coming uh, to our program about repressed uh, memories and remembering trauma. Uh, how victims remember traumatic events is a hotly debated issue in psychology circles. Diagnoses like post-traumatic stress disorder and repressed memory evoke strong reactions among experts and the general public alike. Whether those disorders even exist at all is a controversial subject that spills out of the clinical se settings, out of laboratories, and into families, into the courtroom, into classrooms, and it's capturing headlines and influencing legislation. Professor Richard McNally arrives at significant conclusions about memory. He claims, first and foremost, that traumatic experiences are literally unforgettable. That is to say, not forgettable. And that while we sometimes do not think about disturbing experiences for long periods of time, um, traumatic or harmful events rarely slip from our awareness for very long. 
In his book, Remembering Trauma, Dr. McNally tells us that failure to think about traumas, such as early sexual abuse, must not be confused with amnesia or an inability to remember these events. In fact, he ultimately finds that the evidence for repressed memory of trauma is not substantiated. What are the implications for mental health professionals, for patients, for social workers, for lawyers, and for scientists interested in the psychological effects of trauma? Professor McNally is a therapist and a professor of psychology at Harvard University. He received his B.S. in uh, psychology from Wayne State University in 1976 and his Ph.D. in clinical psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1982. He spent the next two years as a clinical psychology intern and postdoctoral fellow at the Behavior Therapy Unit in the Department of Psychiatry at Temple University Medical School before moving to the Chicago Medical School where he established a research and treatment clinic for anxiety disorders. He joined the Harvard faculty as associate professor in 1991 and was promoted to professor in 1995. He served on the specific phobia and post-traumatic stress disorder committees of the American Psychiatric Association's DSM-4 task force and on the National, Mental, uh, National Institute of Mental Health's consensus panels for the assessment of panic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. His research interests include the application of cognitive psychology methods to elucidate information processing abnormalities in anxiety disorders, especially panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Please join me in welcoming uh, Richard McNally. Thank you, uh, Bell. Um, a few topics, I think, in American society today, or certainly in psychology, is as controversial or as, or as interesting as that of psychological trauma, um, how it's defined, how it's conceptualized, um, how it's treated, how it's remembered, how it's forgotten. And what I'd like to do here today is not to you know, present my uh, data up on a slide and so forth. I've got my PowerPoint here, a set of cue cards for me but rather to touch upon just a couple of the different themes, so to open it up with a couple of the different controversial themes. One of them you mentioned already, Abel mentioned the issue of repressed and recovered memories. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, but also a couple of other themes that have also been in the headlines regarding trauma and its treatment. Uh, the, the, the concept of psychological trauma actually has its origins, really, in surgery. I mean, the concept of trauma really referred to either a direct physical blow to the body or the damage resulting thereof. Uh, but in 19th century uh, uh, psychiatry, uh, in Europe, uh, a lot of physicians were working with people who had been in railway crashes and the like, things of this sort, were not necessarily physically damaged, uh, conceptualized this notion of psychic trauma, psychological trauma. The mind somehow could be damaged by the meaning of certain events, just as the body might be damaged by physical events. So it's sort of a, a metaphorical extension into psychology from surgery. This is where the whole concept of psychic trauma really arises. Now, um, the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, that was put into our official diagnostic manual, the so-called DSM-3, 1980. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the notion of psychological trauma is a, is a mental disorder been codified here in the DSM-3 largely because of the results of the Vietnam veterans. Uh, what had happened uh, with a lot of the guys who were coming back from Vietnam, uh, many of them appeared to have had pretty good w adjustment uh, after the war, and then only later began to develop problems that were then attributed to their service in Vietnam. This made it very, very different from combat reactions in World War I, World War II. In those wars, people did break down under combat, but did so on the battlefield, and were often then removed uh, until they could recover. Vietnam War was very different. There's very, very few psychiatric casualties in Vietnam. In fact, it's very interesting to read the literature from the 1960s and 70s. All the psychiatrists who were working in Vietnam were sort of surprised. Very few people were breaking down in combat. But only later did this happen. Only later did these problems start to emerge. And it was originally the concept of PTSD then was seen as sort of a delayed stress syndrome. The notion that you could have a traumatic event and apparently be okay for a long period of time, and then suddenly develop these problems. In any event, 
Uh, the, the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder was originally seen as just sort of a, a post-Vietnam sort of syndrome. And a lot of the people who were involved in the DSM-3 were very skeptical of including in the diagnostic manner of psychiatry an event that was tied to a historical event, or a disorder tied to a historical event. But then what had happened is that people working with veterans made common cause with uh, clinicians who were working with rape survivors, survivors of the Holocaust, natural disasters. And a lot of these clinicians tended to say, well, my goodness, it looks like a lot of the symptoms that people are experiencing really are in common. It's not unique to Vietnam per se, but that PTSD is really a response to an overwhelming stressor of whatever sort, not necessarily combat. And so it's interesting. In the original DSM-3, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a psychiatric syndrome arising uh, uh, caused by a recognizable stressor that would evoke significant distress in almost everyone. And it was generally outside the range of everyday experience. So our concept of trauma back in 1980 was something that was overwhelming, catastrophic, very unusual. Since then, we've gone through a couple of different revisions of the DSM. Uh, I actually served myself on the DSM-4 PTSD committee. There's about 12 of us on this core committee that produced actually a revision in the concept of trauma. Uh, now, the concept of trauma is actually broadened, officially speaking. Now, a traumatic stressor is one refers to a, the person has experienced, witnessed, or been confronted with an event or events that involve actual or threatened death or serious injury or a threat to the physical integrity or self or others. Very convoluted sort of definition. But it was meant to cover situations whereby somebody has um, witnessed a horrific event occurring to someone else, and then the person who's witnessed it then is experiencing these symptoms. And there was also cases that we considered when we were reformulating the diagnostic criteria where people were received information about horrific events. They didn't even witness it directly, let alone experience it. And they, too, seemed to have these problems. For example, there was one set of studies that came out of uh, the conflict in Beirut in the 1980s in which teenagers heard that certain of their relatives and friends had been abducted, tortured, and killed by militia. Upon hearing these sorts of stories, some of these kids began to have nightmares and numbing and, and anxiety and so forth, startle reactions. And so they seem to be developing post-traumatic stress disorder. They were not directly traumatized, nor did they witness it, but they heard about it, confronted with it. Now, so the, so the concept of trauma then broadened in order to make room, so to speak, for individuals who develop this profile of symptoms, this reliving of the traumatic event, being haunted by the memories of trauma, being disconnected from others and having startle reactions and anxiety and, and so forth in response to things that were not directly experienced. But there's been some interesting fallout from this. As we've broadened our concept of trauma, we, it's been sort of a, a bracket creep, so to speak. It's sort of been expanding and expanding and expanding in order to cover these cases. But as things continue to expand, as the range of events that are deemed potentially traumatic, in fact, some recent surveys indicate that 90% of Americans now, adults, have been exposed to PTSD qualifying stressors, even though few of them ever developed the disorder. So as things have expanded like this, it's become increasingly tough to distinguish between symptoms of a disorder, a disease state, PTSD, and symptoms of normal human responses to stress. Where do we draw the line between disease and normal emotion? This came really came, hit home after the 9-11 attacks. For example, in a couple of weeks, actually, a month or so, after the attacks on 9-11, a survey appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine conducted by some scholars at the Rand, uh, or the Rand uh, Corporation. They had surveyed Americans, not New Yorkers, Americans, by phone had, on the weekend after the attacks. You know, they asked the individuals uh, who were in the survey, have you had any of these symptoms, such as anxiety, difficulty, con difficulty concentrating, being irritable, being angry, having difficulty sleeping since last Tuesday, since the attacks. Turns out that many people did, in fact, have these symptoms. And, and, and the authors of this survey concluded that there are 44% of Americans had substantial symptoms of stress. And it was very interesting because the way this was sort of framed was that watching, for example, being confronted with 
the 9-11 attacks on television, hearing about these things, even if you were not directly exposed, was now, as our concept of trauma has broadened, is embracing a wide range of events and these normal emotional reactions. If someone, for example, was very angry at Osama bin Laden on the weekend after the attacks, they qualified as having a, quote-unquote, post-traumatic stress disorder symptom. And so after the, these surveys began to uh, uh, um, come forth, many people in our field began to worry that we were pathologizing normal human emotion, that having such reactions was quite normal and not necessarily indicative of disease or disorder. Likewise, for example, someone might have, let's suppose we took a survey, we found how many people were coughing in a particular room. You know, having a cough might be a sign of you know, lung cancer or some other disease. And someone who's simply coughing, we wouldn't say that's a, so many percentage of the people are showing symptoms of cancer or, lung, or emphysema merely because they've coughed. Right? So, so th this is a, a real tough problem that we're struggling with here. Where do we demarcate the symptoms of disease and disorder from a normal reactions? In fact, uh, interestingly enough, um, in the United States in the fall of 2001, many um, uh, companies and uh, uh, play workplaces and so forth were offering counseling. One survey uh, revealed that 28% of Americans throughout the United States, not just in New York, have been offered counseling uh, for possible post-traumatic stress symptoms vicariously acquired through exposure to the events in the media and elsewhere. Uh, of course, in New York itself, that's where the, the major concern was, certainly, because these are the people who are directly exposed. Uh, and Project Liberty was a very large project that was uh, set up to provide um, therapy services for the many millions of New Yorkers. 2.5 million were predicted to develop post-traumatic stress disorder after the attacks. Uh, this uh, and so 154 million dollars were, were was set aside for this, but something very strange happened. All of these um, clinics were being set up. Everybody was ready to treat the many millions, 2.5 million, who were to seek therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder after the attacks. But hardly anybody showed up. Now the reaction to this was, was interesting. People didn't know quite what to make of it. Some people said, well, avoidance behavior, avoidance of reminders of the trauma, that itself is a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. Perhaps the failure of people to seek help after the 9-11 attacks simply indicates there's more evidence for the disorder itself. At one point, there were suggestions that we might want to be buttonholing people on the street and doing set of sidewalk assessments for those who might be avoidant. And and so this was, the, this was the issue. There were people who did seek help, but it turned out many of them had been suffering from other problems before and were not being treated. Depression, uh, anxiety disorders, and so forth. A and the 9-11 thing was sort of a ticket of admission where they could get help that they definitely needed for problems that were pre-existing. Now, of course, as you might imagine, that there was also surveys done in New York City. One of the first ones done indicated that it looked as if 7.5% of, of uh, people had probable PTSD in New York, in, in Manhattan to be precise, um, after the attacks that were attributable to the attacks. Uh, these investigators, six months later, went back and did another survey. It was another different random sample. I won't bore you with the details. But suffice it to say, this, this epidemic of PTSD, by the time they went back and checked again in six months, it vanished basically gone. And, and once again, we're, we're left wondering here, did the investigators originally mistake ordinary reactions to terrible events for symptoms of this disorder? It's kind of tough to tell. At any event, um, what happened therapeutically uh, in New York is something that had been happening really um, in, in many venues now uh, for the past 20 years increasingly. Given that post-traumatic stress disorder, when it does develop, can often become chronic and very disabling, many mental health professionals said, well, what we need to do here, when there are terrible events that have happened, we need to intervene early. The sooner, the better. We need to intervene early. Nip it in the bud before something becomes chronic. And so individuals had developed these things called psychological debriefing, Interventions. Those of you who read The New Yorker may have seen Jerry Groupman's article on this uh, a couple weeks ago. 
on this industry that has developed to provide early intervention, a special type of crisis intervention, critical incident stress debriefing, psychological debriefing, that is designed to help people process traumatic events right after they occur, within days after they occur, so they don't develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, what had happened in 9-11, this was, uh, brought a lot of attention to this, this, this growing issue, because there were thousands of therapists and other counselors and debriefers that sort of arrived in New York City, descended in New York, to provide their services, many free of charge. And uh, they were hoping to uh, provide assistance to firefighters and rescue workers and just people in general to provide debriefing services. What these sorts of debriefing interventions involve are, uh, you, you, it can be done one-on-one -on -one or a group of people who've shared a particular traumatic event, maybe police officers or firefighters. And the idea makes a lot of sense when you think about it. It's certainly completely in accordance with prevailing biases and assumptions in our culture. That is to say, it makes sense to sit together with a group of people who've had a ex traumatic event and express your thoughts and feelings about the event in a supportive group context, where it's okay to talk about these things. It's okay to get it off your chest. You don't want to button it up. You don't want to repress it or push it down. You want to be able to ventilate it, process the event in the supportive group setting in order to facilitate emotional processing and prevent problems from developing later. The assumption being is if you don't do that, there'll be a cost later. There may be a stiff upper lip now, but you'll pay for it later. That being the assumption behind the psychological debriefing. So it's sort of a preventive early intervention. It turns out that what happened here is that many individuals, many researchers then, have actually you know, studied this. It seems to make sense. This ought to work. It ought to reduce distress, prevent disorder, nip it in the bud. Turns out there's two conclusions that have emerged in all the research studies that have been done on this. Two kinds of findings occur. One, it doesn't work. Two, it hurts. Very surprisingly. So most of the studies have, have found that people who don't receive the debriefing intervention don't do any worse than those who do. And a couple of the better controlled studies, they were done on one-on-one -on -one individuals, not in group settings, but nevertheless, the same procedures indicated that this type of emotional processing that is often sort of imposed on individuals shortly after the event may actually impede natural recovery from trauma. That is to say, in some studies, what had happened is that the, these individuals had actually done worse who got the debriefing than the people who didn't get it. In other words, it, it didn't worsen them, but they just didn't get better. Um, so uh, uh, as you can imagine right now, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists are working on, on, on new ways to intervene uh, uh, to help people uh, recover from the effects of trauma and to prevent later disorders that are different from this coming in and having to do this right at the time and talking about this this way. It's sort of interesting. It has been very common throughout uh, industry. I know one, one journalist told me after the 9-11 attacks, he mentioned that there were some 85 companies, 80, 85 companies that were housed at the World Trade Center. All of these companies were prov uh, hiring debriefing services to come in and to debrief all their employees. Uh, for several reasons. One, of course, they were concerned about the welfare of the employees, and two, uh, they were concerned about you know, the economics of it. An employee who develops post-traumatic stress disorder is haunted by memories of what happened, is not going to be an efficient employee. And three, of course, was concerns about liability, that there maybe is a duty of care. They got, uh, you know, this terrible thing happened at work, and maybe you have to take steps to prevent later problems, and if you don't, there may be liability concerns. So these are sort of the motivations, and now, ironically, we find out that what, what uh, the field's been doing either doesn't work or it actually hurts. Okay, uh, the last thing I wanted to touch upon here, before we sort of open it up, I guess, to the more general uh, discussion, uh, is the issue about how people remember or forget traumatic events. And the whole concept of PTSD is really about vivid memories of trauma. Traumatic experiences are sort of vividly engraved in memory. These are the sorts of things that are remembered very well. However, there's a group of theorists, I'm going to call them traumatic amnesia theorists, for lack of a better word, who w would agree with that, that, that most people remember traumatic events all too well. But they claim that there's a significant minority of individuals, perhaps 3rd, 20, 30% of individuals, that when they experience traumatic events that are so intense... In other words, that the more intense the event is, the better you can remember it, up to a point. And then suddenly, once it passes that point, things become so traumatic that the mind protects itself by banishing 
these, these memories from awareness, making them very, very difficult to recall until years later. That is to say, some of the traumatic amnesia theorists say that people can often, uh, often make it very difficult, they often have a hard time remembering traumatic events because they are so traumatic. Now, it's interesting, uh, what has happened in this particular debate is that the traumatic amnesia folks are, they cite the literature. They, 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 they will cite all kinds of references and different types of research studies to show that indeed people very often cannot recall, except under special circumstances, their most traumatic experiences. But what's interesting about this, though, is that when you take a, take a look at the kinds of evidence, the kind of evidence that's adduced to support the claim that people have great difficulty remembering their most traumatic experiences, or at least a minority of people do, what you find is that many of the theorists seem to be misinterpreting the very studies they cite in support of this phenomenon. What I'd like to do is just talk about some of the different ways people have sort of kind of confused things a bit. For example, you'll find studies uh, mentioned by the traumatic amnesia, uh, amnesia theorists in which actually the, the people, the, the, the trauma victims, um, actually are experiencing everyday forgetfulness rather than traumatic amnesia. Traumatic amnesia is the inability to remember the trauma. Let me just give you an example of this. In the early 1980s, there was a terrible disaster that happened in Kansas City, Hyatt Regency. It's a big dinner dance that was occurring. I mean, it was sort of in the, in the lobby, and they had these skywalks above, and they suddenly came crashing down, right, on all these people in the middle of the dinner dance. As a friend of mine, Richard Gist, was involved in you know, the, 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 the emergency work there. Was, I've seen the tapes. It was a real terrible, terrible scene. In any event, uh, this one psychiatrist uh, did a research study on, on the folks who had survived this terrible event, either were injured or witnessed it and so forth. It turns out that 27% of these individuals reported memory difficulties after this event. Now, um, uh, this study and many others like it have often been uh, adduced as evidence that people often repress or dissociate the very memories of, uh, the, uh, the, uh, memories of trauma. But close inspection of the study actually indicates that most of the people had repeated overwhelming recollections of the trauma. The memory difficulties that they were experiencing was referring to everyday forgetfulness. So you can get post-traumatic memory impairment, but this refers to everyday forgetfulness that occurs after the trauma. It does not mean an inability to remember the trauma itself. So, for example, uh, uh, other um, individuals have studied torture survivors. Uh, uh, one uh, psychiatrist here at H uh, Harvard has uh, studied individuals who were, um, survived the Pol Pot regime. And many of these people do have memory difficulties in everyday life. And even his work is sometimes cited as evidence for, quote, unquote, repressed memory and so on and so forth. But actually what it is, is that the person is often haunted by the memories of their trauma, and they forget someone's birthday. They leave the cake in the oven. They forget things that they wanted to pick up when they were going to the grocery store, things like that. Moral of the story is that you cannot confuse post-traumatic everyday forgetfulness with an inability to remember the trauma itself. In fact, remembering the trauma itself seems to be perhaps one of the reasons why people often are forgetful. A second confusion that occurs is between the syndrome of psychogenic amnesia and this uh, uh, traumatic amnesia uh, uh, sort of phenomenon. Psychogenic amnesia is a real syndrome, actually. It's very rare. But what happens is that the person experiences sudden, massive, retrograde memory loss, including loss of personal identity. So all of a sudden, the person just forgets who he is, forgets everything about his life prior to this moment. Suddenly, just like this. Sometimes these sorts of events are precipitated by stressful events, but they're seldom very traumatic events. So, for example, it may be a, a, a breakup of a love affair, difficulty in the job, and things of this sort. They don't seem to be the sort of events that would cause such a tremendous impact. There's no obvious organic insult, no direct physical damage to the brain, as far as we can tell. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, th this is no apparent damage. Um, but the funny thing about psychogenic amnesia, though, it persists for hours, days, or weeks, and suddenly it typically remits. And suddenly the memories come back. Okay? That's the typical picture. Now, occasionally people have confused this sort of phenomenon 
which may perhaps have a neurological basis. There may be many strokes going on that are not being detected, okay? I mean, we're not really sure. But uh, it's very different from the, the notion of inability to forget your traumatic events. So when someone has the alleged traumatic amnesia, they don't forget their identity. They know who, they, they know who uh, the person knows who he is. He just forgets the traumatic event, so goes the theory. But they don't forget everything about the, the previous life including the personal identity. So this is a very different sort of phenomena. Psychogenic amnesia is not the same thing as this uh, postulated phenomenon of traumatic amnesia. Another confusion that we sometimes see is incomplete encoding of an event, getting into the brain in the first place, with traumatic amnesia. We actually have a symptom in the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder that it goes... Inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma. Unfortunately, you know, looking back on this now some years after the fact, I think we have to say that this symptom is, is really quite ambiguous. It's really quite ambiguous. The mind is not a video recorder, okay? So not everything gets stored in the mind, gets stored in the brain. Not every aspect of a traumatic experience will get encoded into memory in the first place. Especially under traumatic events, people tend to focus attention, tend to focus attention on the most central aspects of the event as it's unfolding. And if the event is a rapidly unfolding event, their attention will get focused on that, and they may not encode, they may not learn, they may not get into memory other aspects of it, including potentially what might seem important aspects. But an incomplete encoding of the event must, be not, must not be confused with an inability to remember the event. So, for example, there's a, there's a phenomenon called weapon focus. So let's consider someone who's working at a 7-Eleven store. Someone comes in, pulls out a gun, you know, and, says, and demands the money from the cash register. Many people will be standing there. They'll be rifling through the cash register and staring at the weapon. They're encoding the weapon. The law enforcement people arrive later and they say, okay, what did the assailant look like? What did the guy look like? And the person says, I don't know. You know, do you get any description? No, I don't know. They can't even remember the person's face. That would seem to be an important aspect of the event. But what happens under these circumstances is that attention narrows under these circumstances, and, and the memory of the assailant, the face, never gets in there in the first place. It's not that it's repressed or it's dissociated, et cetera, et cetera. It just never got in there. So an amnesia, inability to remember the assailant's face, presupposes that it got in there in the first place, and under many circumstances, that didn't happen. We also have a problem with non-disclosure with traumatic amnesia, confusing non-disclosure with traumatic amnesia. This one's a real tricky one. There's been some very important surveys have done, been done of individuals who we know were sexually or physically abused as kids. There's plenty of court documentation for these things and medical documentation. Survey interviewers have often gone to these people's homes and so forth and asked them a whole bunch of different questions and asked them whether they've ever been physically abused or sexually abused. And some of these individuals say, no. No, they haven't. They deny it. Now, this is what makes this field so tough. How do you interpret that? You know, based on your independent information, that these, this person did have these experiences as a kid, and now you're interviewing this person during the survey as, as an adult, and they say, no, this didn't happen. What do we make of this? The problem here in some of these studies is it's very tough to dis distinguish between non-disclosure and unwillingness to talk to the interviewer about this and an inability to remember the trauma. Maybe they can't remember it. That's entirely possible. But you, can, you, you have to be very careful here. For example, there was one study that was done with a bunch of guys who had uh, been physically abused, some also sexually abused. And um, th they talked about this. They were uh, young uh, kids, uh, you know, school-age kids. They were later, serve, they were later interviewed in a certain segment of this group uh, when asked whether they'd ever been abused. Father was physically violent and so forth. These guys said, no, no, it didn't happen to me. And these investigators said, well, hmm, this is interesting. So we've got, we've got, we know that this happened. These, the kids talked about it at one point in time. And point two, they said it didn't happen. So what they then did, they went back for time three and asked, you know, asked these young men about what they made of this, the discrepancy. And in every case, they said, okay, I remembered it at time two, but I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't like the interviewer. I just didn't like that person. In other cases, they said, my father was manic depressive at the time when he's doing this. He's doing okay now. I, let's let a sleeping dog lie. I don't want to talk about this. Or it's just too personal. It's too embarrassing, too upsetting. So I said, no, 
I don't know. It didn't happen to me. So the moral of the story here is it's, it's really a challenge for us to, to, to distinguish sometimes between non-disclosure, unwillingness, when someone remembers, and an actual inability to remember. Related to this is the issue of childhood amnesia. Most people can remember very few events from their early years. This is normal. And in some of the major surveys, there was one very clever study done by a sociologist a number of years ago in which she knew uh, that a lot of the women in this particular survey had, in fact, been taken to the hospital as kids uh, for suspected childhood sexual abuse. In fact, they're often able to verify this medically, which is often tough to do. When they were interviewed many years later, an average of 17 years later, it turned out that 12% of them denied ever having been sexually abused. It was, they were asked a whole bunch of different questions on this medical survey, including that one. Uh, but the meaning of this answer of no is, is tough, to, tough to determine. Some of, the, some of the deniers, so to speak, in the study were very young, not all of them, but some were very, very young, three and four years old. And, and it's very tough to remember much of anything from that stage of life. It's, we really can't tell whether at least some of these cases were instances of simple childhood amnesia. That is to say that early events are not easy to assess later. We also have got uh, occasionally, sometimes gets confounded in our literature, confusing organic amnesia with traumatic amnesia. For example, uh, three uh, uh, scholars in this field, traumatic amnesia theorists, I'm going to uh, quote from uh, their book here. Uh, they were making reference to this one study when they were discussing traumatic amnesia. It said, Dollinger, 1985, found that two of the 38 children studied after watching lightning strike and kill a playmate had no memory of the event. Quote, unquote. This study was mentioned um, because it was one in which we're dealing with children, we're not dealing with sexual abuse, we're not dealing with psychotherapy, we're not dealing about concerns of corroborating the memory. This event really happened. It was in downstate Illinois. A bunch of kids were playing soccer one summer day. And suddenly, this thunderstorm comes rolling in, and this lightning bolt comes right down onto the playing field and hits this young kid, killing the kid. As you can imagine, uh, uh, this child's teammates were extremely distressed and upset by this. And there were two kids who were present, but absolutely no memory for this. Not at all. But the guys who cite this as potentially relevant to the traumatic amnesia, however, forgot to mention that both of the amnesic children had themselves been hit by side flashes from the lightning bolt, knocked unconscious, and nearly killed. That's important to keep in mind. Because um, being hit by lightning is a tremendous uh, insult to the brain. Uh, and these, these kids, actually, there was, in this article and also some accompanying ones, it was published in the pediatrics literature. Um, these kids were uh, flown to nearby St. Louis, and it was kind of a medical miracle, as they say, that they ever even survived. Um, but the kids were, were saved. Uh, but they had no memory for the event. But being struck by lightning, is, is, is an organic cause, so to speak, uh, of not having memory for this. Finally, uh, the, the biggest I, uh, confusion, if that's the right word, that we see in, in this field, the one we see the most of, is confusing not thinking about something for a long time with traumatic amnesia. For example, there was one survey done, a very famous survey done in our field, in which uh, uh, two, psycholo uh, uh, two uh, uh, psychologists and social worker actually had surveyed 450 psychotherapy patients. They had uh, made contact with a network of providers, a bunch of psychotherapists who work with adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, and um, they, they got consent to send out these questionnaires. So they surveyed all, all these psychotherapy patients, 450 of them, a lot of them, who had been in, being in treatment for the effects of uh, childhood sexual abuse. Now, there are a lot of questions on this survey, but one question was, was there ever a time when you could not remember, could not remember, uh, the forced sexual experience? Almost 60% of the people said yes. But if you think about that for a second, an affirmative response to that, uh, affirmative response to that question implies unsuccessful retrieval attempts, unsuccessful attempts to remember. But if subjects were unaware of their abuse, on what basis would they attempt to recall it in the first place? That's sort of a 
funny situation. So, for example, uh, a person might have some in evidence. Well, I, I, for example, I might say, well, I'm convinced that my parents celebrated my second birthday. There was probably a cake with two candles on it and so forth. And there may have been a time in my life when I tried and I tried and I tried to remember my second birthday and just came up empty. Couldn't remember it, okay? But in this situation here, it's unlike the situation with the birthday cake and so on and so forth, where there's some independent reason why you might think this might have happened. What's going on in this particular case? I think the best way to make sense of this question is that the respondents in this survey must have interpreted the question as meaning, has there ever been a time when you did not think about your abuse? That question does make sense. But not thinking about one's abuse is not the same thing as being unable to remember it. And it's on inability to remember is what defines amnesia. So, for example, had we have, had we've spoken to these individuals during the period of time when they weren't thinking about these events that had happened, would the events come to mind just like this? Quite possibly. For example, in, in our own laboratory uh, across the river over at the Department of Psychology in Harvard, we've been studying a lot of individuals recruited from the community, not from psychotherapy networks or anything of this sort, who report recovering memories of childhood sexual abuse. Um, <clears throat> these individuals very rarely have come out of psychotherapy. Uh, some have been in psychotherapy, but long after they or after they retrieve the memories. And uh, they often describe events happening when they were young, eight, nine years old, when someone had fondled them. And uh, usually the, the, the abuse was never reported as violent. It was, it was always someone they knew. It was never a stranger. It was a stepfather, the mother's boyfriend, things of this sort. And um, it was, and these, uh, these now adults described at the time what it was like. They said, well, they, uh, it, was, it was upsetting, it was puzzling, it was confusing, it was kind of scary, it was gross or disgusting. This was sort of the reaction, this is how they remember. remember. But they didn't describe it as traumatic in the sense of being life-threatening, overwhelmingly terrifying, the, the sort of classic sense of trauma. It was, a, it was unpleasant, and some of them didn't even realize it as sexual at the time. Then what happened, this is sort of the modal, typical case, then what happened is... Um, the perpetrator was kicked out. You know, the mother kicked the boyfriend out of the apartment. He's gone, gone. Uh, 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 the stepfather died, or they moved to a new neighborhood, and, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And these kids just didn't think about it. They sort of put it out of their mind. It was an unpleasant experience. They just didn't think about it. They got on with their lives. And for many years, they didn't think about it. And then suddenly, they were reminded of it years later. Then it came right back. They would read an article about incest or uh, you know, the, the, the controversy about the Boston priest and so forth, and suddenly the, the memory would come back, and then they would reappraise it in many cases. Say, my God, that was sexual abuse. I was sexually abused as a kid. Didn't understand it quite like that at the time. Didn't think about it for many years. This doesn't mean that it was repressed, it was dissociated or anything of that sort. But they didn't have the reminders present. And so I think that uh, this may be what's happening in, in a lot of these cases. So just to tie this up with just a couple of points here. The people exposed to traumatic events, and traumatic I'm referring here to life-threatening, overwhelmingly terrifying in the original sense of the word, are seldom incapable of remembering these events. People may not think about certain events for a long time, especially if the events were not experienced as traumatic at the time of their occurrence, even if they may have been aversive, upsetting, and unpleasant. But not thinking about something is not the same thing as being unable to remember it. And it's in inability to remember in the presence of the appropriate cues that constitutes amnesia. And that's where uh, uh, I part, uh, uh, part ways with the traumatic amnesia theorists. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So, uh, would you uh, like to line up in front of the microphone so that we can um, hear your words on our webcast? Um, anyone want to begin? If not, I have some questions. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you could use the one on the side. Sorry. <laughs> 
Um, yes, yes, somewhat, yes. It was an early, early forensic case. Mm -hmm. with everything you say. I, I think he, he did kill that girl, um, partly because I thought there was other evidence. In fact, when the police came around questioning uh, to find out, I guess, just where all the you know, men around were at the time, one of his daughters, the other daughter, um, started to open her mouth, and the father, like, kicked her in the ribs. So I think he had something to hide. And that, I, I mean, regardless of the, the repression of the memory, I think he actually did the crime. So in that event, if he did do the crime, how can you explain the daughter who supposedly witnessed it when she saw her own daughter who looked so much like the victim that that triggered her remembering it when she supposedly did not? all these years, did she just not think about it because it was so horrible? Well, that's a... If that, you know, if yeah. he did it. <laughs> yeah, can you review the case very briefly? Oh, oh gosh, just yeah. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was, a, this was a very controversial case where um, there had been um, uh, a young girl, I, I, as I recall, she had uh, been murdered in, in uh, Eileen Franklin, who was uh, now a young woman. Um, and, uh, again, my recollection of this case is a little bit uh, sketchy here, but um, her father apparently was charged with uh, uh, the murder, and she had recovered the memory, uh, supposedly, of having witnessed this homicide um, uh, many years later. I, there were a couple of different versions of this. One was the one that you mentioned, that she had looked at one of her own children, and somehow that r reminded her of, of the death of her friend. Uh, the other version I heard was that she'd been being hypnotized for some other reason, and it was so. I, I really don't know the details of the case, uh, and to, to speak with it, any sort of authority. But I think that you know, before we can ask for an explanation for the phenomena, why somebody would be apparently unable to remember a horrific murder that they witnessed, we have to make sure that in fact that this guy actually did it. I mean, because uh, there's certainly been cases. Uh, in the literature uh, and childhood PTSD, for example, where there was no question uh, that the child had either witnessed the murder or had w w found the body right thereafter, and these children did not forget it. In fact, in fact, there were, all of them had post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, s same with also having or witnessing uh, their mother being raped by an intruder. I mean, so, so when you really get these, w w and, and these events are, were not uh, controversial. I mean, these things clearly happened, and, and, and the kid was clearly at the scene of the crime and so forth. And so we, we know the facts of the case. And when you do know those facts of the case, you find out that the fact the child doesn't forget these things. These kids are extremely distressed about it. In the Franklin case, as I recall, she continued to have a relationship with her father and so on and so forth. And, and it was just a very uh, unusual uh, sort of case. Yeah, yeah, I remember reading things to that effect as well. But that's still not the same thing as committing homicide. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Other, other questions? Can you come up to the front, please? Yeah, I actually had, uh, can you hear me? Sure. I actually had uh, two quick questions, uh, rather unrelated. Uh, one is, uh, <laughs> have you already received requests to be expert testimony in criminal cases based on your researches. I mean, I'm not interested in the details, but I'm just curious to see if this is already starting to affect the legal profession now, not just, not just the, you know, it's not, it's not just limited to the medical the, and, and psychiatric communities. Oh, okay. So I'll answer that question first. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes. I don't do, I don't do forensic work. Um, I don't have the time to do forensic work. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, I've been asked many times um, to serve as expert witness on, on both sides of these cases, actually, um, usually involving trauma and memory, occasionally other things such as panic disorder and agoraphobia. Believe it or not, even those things sometimes wind up in the courtroom. Uh, but usually it's, it's trauma cases. Um, I certainly think that in the forensic cases, 
I think we want to have the judicial process informed by the science as best as we can, and I certainly applaud that when people are, in fact, um, uh, using science to inform the judicial process. I personally just do not have the time to do this, and so I've always, when I've asked to do this, I'll refer uh, attorneys to people I know who are very competent and who have part of their work week devoted to such activities. I do not, so, <laughs> so I, I never do forensic work. The other question is on a much more general plane. How does uh, this whole issue now, this modern concept of trauma and, and uh, you know, am post-traumatic amnesia, if, if, if in fact it exists or doesn't, how does this uh, tie into or grow out of uh, Freud's classic ideas of repression uh, from incidents that occur? I mean, <clears throat> does it grow out of that, is that or, or is that something sort of different? Well... It's partly related to this. The interesting thing about Freud is when you read Freud's work, his concept of repression was varied. <laughs> uh, if you take Introduction to Psychology, you'll probably remember that the author said, repression is when the mind unconsciously, without you knowing it, banishing something from awareness, and it's hidden away, and you don't even know you did it. That's repression. If you deliberately try to push something out of awareness, that's suppression, willing, effortful suppression. So you often see that distinction. Actually, that's Anna Freud's distinction, his, Freud's daughter. Yeah, I mean, that's where that really came from. Sigmund Freud himself, he was all over the place. You know, sometimes he said repression is pushing things out deliberately. Other times he said the mind keeps it out even though you don't know it. And sometimes he says it doesn't matter one way or another. So he was very cavalier about the concept of repression which has caused some confusion in the media recently with Mike Anderson's work where he's talking. Well, he, Anderson, this, I don't want to go on too much into the science here, but there was a lot of press given recently to some interesting experiments on people's ability to uh, forget, uh, uh, so forth, suppress things from memory. And the, the, the authors of the article talked about Freud's concept of voluntary suppression. They accurately characterized it in their article, but the media thought it had something to do with this unconscious mechanism. It all got garbled up, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, so Freud really was all over the place uh, on the concept of this mechanism. Thank you. Other questions? I think we have one here that's a little closer. We'll start with you, and then you'll be next. Is it your view then, Doctor, for example, on the um, cases of adults who remember sexual abuse as a child, that the abuse occurred, but you wouldn't call it traumatic amnesia, you'd call it memories that were simply being recovered because they hadn't thought about it, or instead, that at least in some instances, the events never occurred, but the memory was triggered from some other mechanisms, such as therapy or something like that, or both? Well, I think all of these sorts of things can happen. Uh, that, that's my intuition. The problem in our own research, incidentally, when we work with individuals who report recovering sexual abuse memories, is that in no instance were, have we ever been able to corroborate the memory. However, I want to emphasize that not having corroboration does not mean it's a false memory, let alone one that's quote-unquote implanted. You often hear this terrible word, implanted. Therapists are not trying to implant anything. They may inadvertently foster false memories. That's, that, I suspect, is the case sometimes. But, um, I, you know, I, I think in, in um, um, many of these cases, you, you do find the event that was, I, I, assuming that our, our subjects are, are, are accurate, are actually, in fact, conveying accurate recollections, which they may or may not be. I really don't know. Uh, but uh, the fact that they don't characterize it as overwhelmingly terrifying and traumatic at the time it occurs, and the fact that they tried to push it away or didn't think about it, and the, and the cues, the reminders were not present during the period of time when they didn't think about it, that sounds like normal memory mechanisms, not amnesia, not repression, not dissociation. You don't need to invoke any of those concepts to explain that. Then there's also another interesting twist on this. One psychologist, Jonathan Schooler, cognitive psychologist, um, has, has studied this uh, a, a bit where he's found individuals that are very similar to our subjects. And it turns out, however, that during the period of time when they believe they didn't think about the memory, it turns out that they actually did think about it, had talked about it with others, but then they forgot that they had remembered. 
And so you have these interesting situations where in some of Jonathan's subjects, the, the person had uh, had some adverse experience, uh, some traumatic experience, didn't think about it for a period of time, um, but, but then had talked about it with a spouse, often in sort of a matter-of-fact way. They weren't distressed at the time. They were just simply telling these things. And then they forgot they had the conversation with the spouse. And then years later, they think about it. Now they think about it in a different way. It's more emotionally powerful now. And they go, wow, how did I manage not to think about it that long time? And then, and then the spouse says, wait a minute, you told me about it. I did? You know, they forgot that they had remembered. So you can also have that case. So even during the period of time when the person reports not having thought about it, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case because sometimes people simply forget that they remembered. Um, yes, Doctor. You have spoken mostly about sexual abuse with children. I'm just wondering if they've done any studies with small children, say around three or four, if they have experienced a traumatic, traumatic you know, situation where one of their parents actually died in front of them and they were alone with that parent. Uh, Because, you know, you mentioned that the studies have shown that having help right after the incident really, um, you know, hasn't been that successful as far as research has, uh, has been concerned. I'm just wondering, because we have always been told that if something very traumatic happens to our children, it's best, you know, to bring them to somebody and to actually have them, you know, kind of relive the experience in order to kind of get rid of it. Right. Yeah, that, um, the... Um the psychological debriefing intervention, the early crisis intervention that I mentioned, would last for several hours when you get together with an individual or a group of individuals and try to process the event for several hours. That's a one-off intervention that happens fairly soon after the event when people are often raw and unwilling or really to talk about it at that point in time. Now, um, it's important to distinguish that intervention, which has been used in all these crisis situations, from other types of psychotherapies that are typically delivered weeks, months after the event and are done in a more structured context. There's these cognitive behavioral therapies, for example, involving imaginal exposure and reliving of the event in a supportive context until the person loses the distress associated with it and the meaning of it changes and so forth. But these are things that are done in a psychotherapy context over the course of several weeks and months, typically beginning at least a month, if not later, after the trauma, when the person's ready to confront it. And the, the case you mentioned about the ch- kids, there's not been, been very little work with kids on this, unfortunately, but typically adults, rape survivors in particular, have responded well to that particular intervention. Um, but that's different from these sort of one-off interventions that occur right after the trauma when a person's still in a state of shock and perhaps needs to shut down. So it's important to make that distinction. So the issue of timing, when is this intervention done? A second issue is how many times this, the, the sessions are being held. When are they being held? And what is the context? So talking about the trauma is not bad in itself, but it depends on the, the, the situation and the timing. So just so I understand, so you're defining a traumatic event as something that is life-threatening and emotionally or, or overwhelmingly terrifying. Is that right? Yes, that's, yeah, that, that, that was been the, 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 the sort of the classic typical sense of, of distinguishing what, co- what separates traumatic stressors from the everyday stressors of, of regular life. Yeah, so, so, so typically it's been something that's been perceived as life-threatening, Right. So, you know, the, the combat, rape, and things, and natural disasters mm-hmm. have been sort of the canonical stressors. So would sexual abuse that isn't perceived as life-threatening be considered traumatic? Well, this is, the interest, this is one of the interesting cases that figured in the revision of the diagnostic criteria, the definition of a traumatic stressor. You know, that long definition that I gave you about you know, a threat to the physical integrity of someone. What? Physical integrity and inappropriate sexual experiences. These were some of the things that were brought under the, the canopy of trauma um, that were not originally, would not originally fit 
uh, under the original, more narrower definition. So this is, the, this is the thing we're grappling with at this point in time. We, we broaden the sense of trauma to include these sorts of things, but the broader we make it, the less likely the event itself is going to be accounting for the response. Okay. And the other question I have is, um, are you um, are you aware of a lot of cases of like um, an adult on a an adult's inability to remember um, the total experience of uh, childhood sexual abuse, or or how would you classify that kind of um, inability to remember, I guess. Right, yeah. Well, <clears throat> again, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the mind doesn't operate like a video recorder, so not everything we experience gets into the brain. M much of it's simply forgotten. And when you're dealing with repeated sorts of an events, sometimes it will tend to blend together unless the individual events are especially distinctive. And so, for example, let's take someone who may have been uh, raised with an abusive alcoholic father would tend to go off on these rages and maybe beat the kids and things of this sort. This may have happened many different times. Now, in circumstances like that, repeated events are less likely ever to be forgotten as a class of event. But individual cases might perhaps be forgotten or blended together. It's sort of like someone, for example, who has flown on an airplane many times. You have a very vivid memory, a gist memory, a generic memory of what it's like to be flying on an airplane, or in the terrible case I mentioned, being beaten by your father. But each individual flight or each individual attack might not be remembered. But that's not a matter of some special repression mechanism operating. This is just that repeated events tend to shape into sort of gist-based ones. And what about if certain cues allow you to remember certain up to a certain point and then not the rest? Like, um, just in other words, just uh, stop remembering at some point, exactly. remember a little bit of it, and then nothing else comes back. Is that? Yeah, those are. Yeah, the, you hear about some of those cases. It's not quite clear what you know what is in fact going on uh, in those cases. Um, let me just give you an example. Uh, this is from an. Um, epidemiologic study. Uh, 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 this fellow, uh, this is from Vietnam, uh, uh, this is what he reported. They were on patrol and they were ambushed. Uh, he was there with his buddy who was right behind him. They were sort of in a line and, and hit the ground. They're shooting back at the enemy. This firefight lasted really only a matter of seconds. He has very vivid memory of this, as you might imagine. Yeah. And after it was over, the enemy had disappeared. He turns around and everybody's getting up carefully. It's over. And his, his friend is lying on the ground. And he's not, get, not getting up. And he, he, he turns to move him like this and look, looks at him. And there's a bullet hole right in his friend's head. He's dead. Mm -hmm. Next thing he remembers, he's being asked at the base camp, how did, you, how did you manage to do this? Do what? Carry your friend. This guy was kind of a small guy and his friend was kind of a big guy. Puts him on his shoulder. It's about three-quarters of a mile or something. Takes him back to the base camp. To this day, he does not remember that journey. Now you think, boy, oh boy, you might remember this. What's going on? Did he repress it? Well, the most traumatic event, of course, is when he turned his friend over. He said, my God, there's a bolt right there in the head. Um, so, that, so the notion that he can't remember it because it's so traumatic, well, he remembers the most traumatic aspect. But what apparently is happening in cases like that, the person becomes so absorbed in the, the traumatic event that the stuff that's happening right after it is just not getting encoded. Uh, there was a man I interviewed when I was uh, uh, interviewing the Turkish earthquake survivors a few years ago in Turkey, and he had a very similar sort of a thing where he went on this long journey, didn't remember anything about it after the earthquake. And, and he seemed to be so preoccupied with other stuff, he just went on automatic pilot. He still can't remember it. So I don't think this, cases like that, I don't think the person even encoded the events. They're so preoccupied, their attention is so internally focused that stuff didn't get in. I suspect that's what's going on in some of these cases. That's just my guess. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one revolves around uh, first one revolves around uh, what you said. I think about uh, uh, the uh, uh, realization by the victim at the time they're being uh, traumatized in a sexual abuse situation, whether or not they think it's life-threatening or it's not life-threatening, and how that might impact uh, their memory. <clears throat> uh, uh, I, one of my children, uh, I suspect, was uh, uh, sexually bruised around uh, freshman year in high school or sophomore year in high school because he went through uh, 
quite a substantial metamorphosis, scholastically and athletically. And uh, it took him a couple of three years to, to pull out of it. It was never reported to us, and it turned out just in the last month or two or three, we became aware of one of the uh, members of the faculty of that school was a serial uh, pedophile, and, and like 15 or 18, 22 uh, victims. Now, uh, what I, I, I guess I don't, coming back to what I first said, uh, uh, I suspect very much, because he was a big kid and quite athletic, I suspect that he probably did not think it was a, a life-threatening situation, but I don't know, because uh, we, we've never discussed it. Uh, all of this came into my awareness over, or, as I say, a month or two ago. Uh, could you go over that again once more of uh, what you said about uh, the impact of the concept of whether the situation was life threatening. I'm almost positive <clears throat> uh, our son would have uh, thought this situation was uh, incredibly immoral, indecent, or awful, because we get a lot of that stuff in our <laughs> family history. But the, not, not, not the abuse, but the, you know, the, the, uh, the mores. And, uh, uh, but it was never spoken about. And we had another son come along three or four years later in the same high school, and uh, it was never a factor with him. And of course, we were ob oblivious to all of this p potentially going on at the high school at the time. So review that uh, briefly, if you would, please. Uh, the impact of whether the victim thought the situation was life-threatening. Right, uh, yeah. Um, you know, we've studied a lot of individuals who report childhood sexual abuse experience. I should emphasize that the vast majority of people that we've studied have never forgotten that they're a sexual abuse survivor, have never forgotten it. You know, and no, when yeah. asked about this, they say, forget it. I wish I could forget something like this. No, this is something that haunts me all the time. But we have, we have about uh, three dozen individuals that we've studied who do report uh, uh, being sexually abused as much younger kids, though. We're talking about seven, eight, nine years old, not teenagers. And then not having thought about it for a long time and then being reminded of it later and then reappraising it is very disturbing. They didn't, they never thought, they still don't think that it was life threatening. But the point was they were, they say that when it happened, they were upset, they were frightened, they were confused, they were puzzled, they were disgusted, they were not terrified. Because it was typically someone that they knew, you know, the, 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 the perpetrator was saying, this is our little game, you touch me here, I'll touch you there. These types of things. So it was not a violent, terrifying sort of an event, but it was not a pleasant one. It was one that they had sort of just pushed aside, didn't think about, okay? And then later they reminded Didn't think it. about it, didn't talk about it. Didn't talk? Oh, no. Yeah, okay, okay. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In fact, some of these individuals say... Now, you know, are you it, saying whether or not uh, it was life-threatening or not life-threatening, that would likely be the case? The more, yeah, the more something is perceived as life-threatening, the more likely you're going to be experience the release of the stress hormones, and, and it's going to be consolidated in memory. It's going yeah. to be remembered. The more terrifying it is, the more likely it is to be remembered. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, for non-professionals, people not in this field, uh, can they read something, magazine articles or a book that's not so full of uh, 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 jargon that they can't understand it uh, uh, someplace so that uh, they could, in, uh, you know, Slowly go over what you gave us tonight in, a, in an hour. Well, uh, the, the, the remembering He's got a book trauma written, uh, book actually is, <laughs> is <laughs> actually accessible. Uh, yeah, it, 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 this is uh, not easy no. reading, though. It, this isn't easy. No, oh, you, you might. Uh, I think he's talking about a, a layman's version. Uh, a layman's version. I, I don't, right off the top of my head, I, I don't know one actually. But. I, I think you probably find it in the bookstores under um, self help books. Okay, there, let me talk with you about that. Okay, yeah. Thank you. sure. Uh, yes. How can traumatized individuals change their behavior? How can they change their behavior? Their behavior. Yeah, don't go away. What, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I mean, in what I mean, way are they behaving? Been, if think? they've been affected by trauma and it's affected their lives, how can they change whatever bad behaviors they've done or have been influenced by, how can they change? How can they recover? Is that what you're asking? How can they recover? Yes, how can they get over the, um, the bad effects of what's happened? 
-hmm. How can they change their uh, um, behavior into a more positive behavior? What can they do to change their behavior? I don't know how else to ask it. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what you have in mind. Well, perhaps I can uh, clarify. Uh -huh. Are you saying, are you asking uh, if someone has had a traumatic event and has repressed it or suppressed it or somehow can't remember it mm -hmm. uh, and then acts out and does some asocial behaviors, uh, how do you uh, get rid of those? Is that, is that your question? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... Uh, generally, generally speaking, yes. Well, of course, the people who are who have been exposed to these traumatic events are usually remembering them very well and they're being haunted by them, being disturbed by them and so forth. Um, the, the things that affect us most are the things that, well, we typically remember. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, in fact, when you think about it, it's sort of an odd idea that the most life-transforming, life-changing events in our life are precisely those we can't even remember. That's a very unusual idea that we can thank Freud for, I suppose. Um, but, but in most cases here, when, when people are... Uh, having problems, or having nightmares, and being distressed by these recollections and things of this sort. Some of the uh, therapeutic interventions that I mentioned, where the therapist is helping the person, you know, uh, confront uh, these memories and reappraise the events. For example, a lot of times people will blame themselves for from bringing this on. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misattributions where the person's feeling shame and guilt and so forth, which is quite unwarranted. I mean, a young kid is being violated by somebody. Um, but a lot of these cognitive distortions, these mental distortions and misappraisals can sometimes be corrected by, um, by the therapist. But here we're not talking about the person's behavior per se, you know, acting out or so, so much, but being bothered by the memories. And there, there are ways of, of, of helping them. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that trauma is a distinctive cognitive experience? Distinctive in the sense of the, um, the person being surprised, the person experiencing, feeling they're about to die, that sort of a thing. Well, it's distinctive in that sense. Yeah, or I'm thinking of your example of the guy on point in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. this, yes. You know, on the one hand, clearly there's this phenomenon of, in, of intrusiveness. Right. The intrusiveness of the traumatic memory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the same time, coupled with this gap, or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't have to say it's repressed, right. but nevertheless, there's this kind of unusual experience of a piece of your life kind of not accounted for, if you will. I mean, maybe not so unusual. Maybe, there, of course, mm -hmm. there's a lot mm -hmm. in our lives mm -hmm. that isn't accounted for. But. Well, um, yeah, in this particular case, this may be an instance of a more general psychological phenomena, is that our attention is captured by the most salient, the most gripping, the most emotionally powerful uh, stimuli present. I mean, this attention, this focusing, this narrowing effect. Um, you know, the spotlight of attention, so to speak, turns into a very sharp, bright beam in this case, whereby you're going to remember the things that are in the spotlight and things that are outside of it are just not going to get there in the first place. And so what may be happening in these cases may be not so much qualitatively different in some special sense, but rather an extreme example of how attention and memory works under extremely emotionally intense circumstances. Um, can you just briefly talk about the clinical significance of differentiating between like traumatic amnesia versus, you know, just not remember, like choosing not to remember or you know, putting it aside or maybe you didn't, I missed it completely. But uh, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> you don't have amnesia for any <laughs> such comments. I just didn't mention. Um, no, I think that uh, this is actually a very good question because if you assume that the mind protects itself by segregating the most horrific experiences and sealing them off, point one. Point two, if you assume that these memories silently poison a person's life unbeknownst to the person. Point three, if you assume that you have to lance the boil, so to speak, that you've got to bring the memory out and you've got to process it in some fashion for healing to occur. If you're operating under those assumptions that we can't remember the, our most horrific experiences and we must remember them in order to recover, then you're setting yourself up for some sort of therapeutic interventions that have caused a lot of problems in the last 10 years or so. Whereby, if you assume that the most horrific experiences are those that the person cannot remember, 
then you may assume that special techniques, hypnosis and imagery and sodium amytal, so-called truth serum, not truth serum, but people, it's a sedative, uh, are needed to, to lift, lift the lid of repression. Now, the problem with that is a lot of these memory techniques and therapeutic techniques have fallen into disfavor because a lot of the memories that often did surface under these types of interventions when people had those assumptions that we dissociate or repress our most disturbing experiences, the memories were pretty exotic. Cannibalism, infant sacrifice, satanic ritual abuse. And when these people no, were no longer in therapy, they often thought, hmm, I think I might have been mistaken. Those memories, in fact, were not genuine because there, there were no bodies, there was no, there was no physical evidence of these things. The FBI um, uh, investigated hundreds of these cases, never could find any evidence of these satanic cults and so on and so forth that had these you know, big organized conspiracies that were abusing all these people. So at any event, so, so there is clinical uh, uh, implications here. On the other hand, uh, if you assume that sometimes people will have adverse experiences, won't think about them for a long time, doesn't mean that they're, those are the experiences that are causing their problems, but if you simply ask them whether they had these experiences as a child in ordinary clinical assessment, you're not going to quote unquote create or implant false memories of these hor horrific things. The person may be reminded of it. In fact, even in you know, psychotherapy, people, some of these memories will pop up in a psychotherapy doesn't mean that the therapist has created the memory. doesn't mean that it's a false memory. doesn't mean that it's implanted in some way. It just means that there may have been reminders present. It's not about repression. It's about the, having the cues present. So, uh, so I think there is big clinical, uh, clinical differences here because if you really believe in the repressed memory or dissociated memory theory, you're going to do certain things in therapy that you might not otherwise do. I have um, two com um, a comment and then a question. I'm um, I'm an MSW student in my second year, so I'm not an expert. I'm just a student. But I wanted to respond to um, this gentleman's question right here. Uh, there's a book called Trauma and Recovery. It's by Judith Herman, who is a very um, poignant speaker and very easy to understand. And so I suspect that her book is kind of more consumer oriented or or easy enough to understand if you're not in the profession. Trauma and recovery. Trauma and recovery. It's by Judith Herman. Trauma. And I only know these things because I'm a student. Again, not an expert. But. <laughs> but I, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that she disagrees with you about <laughs> almost everything. <laughs> that part I but, know, uh, anyway. So. <laughs> not yeah, to I'm, get everybody I, excited, but that's okay. Uh, Cambridge Hospital. Yeah, Judy Herman's at Cambridge local, Hospital. Yeah, that's local. Right. Yeah, I've known her since since I came to Harvard in 1991. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we do uh, disagree on some things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that I didn't know, I swear. So. <laughs> um, and then there was a, a woman over here who was asking about what kinds of things can you do to change your behavior as the result of being traumatized. And what came to my mind is in cases of people who have been sexually traumatized or assaulted, abused, what, however you want to... Uh, put it, things like touch therapy, where the therapist kind of experiments with helping the client to um, re-engage in being able to touch someone, re-engage in being intimate, and eventually that, I guess the goal of that is to progress into feeling safer with your, you know, physical boundaries that you can occasionally, you know, trust and, and let somebody in to your life in that way. Are you familiar with touch therapy at all? Can you, maybe you can I am not sure I'm thinking of the same thing that you're talking about. Okay. Is this Bessel van der Kolk's therapy? Is it? Uh, that's yes. possible. I really don't remember okay. off the top so of my head. talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, re I repressed that. Yes, I, I, I am certainly unaware of any sort of evidence okay. for the efficacy, okay. um, effectiveness of such I therapies. I don't. I'm not aware frankly. of that either. I mm -hmm. just um, know that's something that that we've been studying. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask was, as far as the tra traumatic amnesia theorists saying 20 to 30 percent of people who have been traumatized, you know, somehow have these repressed memories. What I wanted to ask you is, is the concept of traumatic amnesia completely null and void for you, or do you believe that there may be a portion of people, albeit a somewhat smaller portion than the theorists would argue, um, that do experience this traumatic amnesia? 
Well, I think it's, you know, it's always possible. You never say never in science, right? There's always some exception to the rule that will pop up, uh, or always seems to be. But I'm talking about sort of the general principles and, and what sort of evidence that we have for such a thing. Um, I guess my big complaint is that a lot of the type of scientific evidence that's adduced in support of the concept of traumatic amnesia really speaks to things that are very, very different from the notion that we can't recall our most horrific experiences. Um, there may very well be cases where, where, where someone has had a terrible experience. They cannot remember it. They're given appropriate retrieval cues, and, and only with great difficulty does the memory return. It's entirely possible. I don't say it's impossible. You can't prove the null hypothesis. You cannot produce, prove that something, for logical reasons, never occurs. I mean, you simply can't do that. It's a logical sort of a thing. So the burden of proof really lies on the shoulders of those who claim that this actually happens with some degree of frequency to provide some evidence. So if you're claiming that someone uh, or, or that people often, in a significant minority of cases, cannot recall these traumatic events and then perhaps later can recall them later, it's really up to you then to provide the evidence for such a claim. People can't prove that repression doesn't occur. Uh, people who believe in such a thing need to provide evidence that it does. If we can get off of sex and back to war. Uh, we have three cohorts of men in the 20th century, the veterans of World War I, II, and Vietnam. Uh, the first war, uh, they're all dead and, and the, most of the psychological trauma was in the form of shell shock. And it occurred on the battlefield, and they came home and they went on with their lives. And that seems also to be true of the men of World War II. Uh, could it be that, that there are disorders because society gives the people permission to have them? The men who came back from World War II didn't have post-traumatic stress disorder because they weren't allowed to. But the men who came back from Vietnam did. Yeah, that's an interesting thesis. Um, the historian Ben Shepard, uh, a British historian who's probably the premier writer on the history of uh, military psychiatry in the 20th century, uh, he's written about this very topic uh, from, unsurprisingly, the British viewpoint. Um, in World War I, there was a lot of uh, compensation provided for the shell shock cases in the UK. And when, in the 1930s, when the British military psychiatrists knew that a war with Hitler was imminent, uh, there was a big debate in England, precisely along the lines that you're mentioning. The older psychiatrists who had worked with the shell shock cases and found out that what they were arguing is that when they provided compensation, as, you know, sort of a pension, if you will, it was actually a pension, that what happened with a lot of those shell shock cases, it became very chronic. And, and, and then he said, well, we have to do something differently in the war that's about to happen, which was World War II. Well, the younger psychiatrists were coming on board. They were making the claim that, oh, no, you know, if someone develops a psychiatric disorder, a shell shock in World War II, so to speak, we have to provide this, this appropriate compensation just as if it were a physical injury and, and the like. Well, there was this big debate between these two groups of British psychiatrists. And it turns out the older guys won. And the British military policy in World War II is very different in terms of the pensions than it was in the First World War. And the rates of the chronic disorder were completely different. And so Shepard, I think, would probably agree with your hypothesis that the social context in which these things occur may influence the prevalence, how frequently these things, the chronic illnesses, develop. It was a very interesting debate in, in Britain because it, it, the people who were arguing against, quote, unquote, making the mistakes of World War I were seen as heartless, pitiless psychology, it was called, quote, unquote. You guys are pitiless. Um, but it was, a very, it was a very interesting thing. Now, of course, the question is, does that mean that, that, that the British soldiers in World War II were suffering with undiagnosed and untreated PTSD because there were no pensions, there was no way, no access for it, nobody just knew about it? Did they suffer in silence? Or... Do they really see their symptoms differently and overcome them and not develop a chronic condition? Hard to say. But the result was very different in the two world wars in England. Yeah, I just remembered something uh, about... Uh, <laughs> see, you don't I just un things. I just unrepressed this memory uh, about a, uh, an article I read a couple of years ago suggesting that the men of World War II who were at that, at that time, 
were uh, at reaching retirement age. And, uh, and there was an expectation that these guys, after having come back from the war and immediately leapt into the society, raised their children, had their families, now all of a sudden uh, they no longer had a job and they could sit around and, and remember the war. And I'm not aware of any great uh, blooming of post-traumatic stress disorder among the World War II guys. Not a great blooming, but there have been interesting scattered case reports that began to emerge in the mid-1980s about such cases uh, that fit this where They were suddenly being disturbed again by memories that hadn't been disturbed, disturbing since the 1940s. Uh, of course, that cohort, too, is also you know, getting older and, 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 and dying, uh, dying at rather high rates now. So it's sort of hard to tell what's going to happen. I, uh, some colleagues at the Boston VA are studying the sort of a late stress reactions in, in older Korean War veterans largely. Uh, so we'll, we'll get some better answers on, uh, to that uh, to, uh, to see whether or not, in fact, when people reach a stage of life when they're looking back on things, are they troubled by things that hadn't troubled them for a long time? I don't know, but I guess we'll, we'll find out more about that. I know there are probably a lot of more questions and um, comments, but I'm afraid that we're running out of time. And I wanted to thank uh, um, Richard McNally for coming. And I'd like to uh, say on behalf of all of us, thanks very much.